So now I would like to move on. Our next presenter is Giovanni Cicella from the University of California, Davis, and also from Georgia Tech. Giovanni, the floor is yours. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Rolf, for organizing this wonderful event. Uh, we have a very packed schedule today, so I will jump right away into my presentation and I will try to stay on time. Uh, I know we have a lot of presenters today. So uh, good morning, everybody from the United States, and it's a pleasure to be here today. I, I will give a, a, a little bit, uh, a brief presentation today about some of the work we're doing at the University of California, Davis, uh, in a study, a behavioral study that is designed really to study the temporary versus longer term impacts of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic on mobility. And uh, as uh, uh, Mike has uh, uh, presented in his presentation, he has shown at the beginning uh, with the Google data, the Apple data, some of the big trends that have been happening during the pandemic. So we are all aware there's been big disruption in uh, uh, changes in the use of cars, public transportation, walking and bicycling, or even for long distance travel for airplanes. And uh, at UC Davis, we launched a large research project to really try to dig into these uh, uh, patterns and really understand who is doing what, uh, to see in particular how the pandemic has affected the different groups of uh, individuals in the population and really try to uh, bring more information about uh, what the, the likely longer term impacts of the pandemic could be. And uh, uh, we were somehow lucky because we could build on a previous uh, study. So somehow in the difficult time of the pandemic, we have from the research perspective, the ability to build uh, on previous research. And so we could build on uh, a previous data collection that we've been doing already in 2018 and 2019. So we have thousands of respondents from before the pandemic for whom we have collected full information about their travel patterns, household organization and activity and so on. And we built a several rounds of data collection during spring 2020 and fall 2020 with two rounds of data collection during the pandemic. We focus mainly on 15 regions of the United States and two regions in Canada, Toronto, Vancouver, and also at a convenient sample internationally. And we are continuing to collect data. So we are about to launch a new round of data collection during the recovery and reopening in spring 2021. And we'll continue to collect data in the future. We already have more than 11,000 participants from whom we are collecting information during the pandemic. Uh, we don't have the time today to go into all the details of this project, but I invite you to check the website postcovid19mobility.ucdavis.edu if you have any additional question on this project. But right now I will just touch about a few details about this research and some key findings to date. So uh, first of all, I want to give like, you know, a sense of the type of data we collected. So uh, we use a survey so that had a very similar structure uh, across all different ways of data collection. So the longitudinal data can provide a lot of information about the evolution of behaviors during the pandemic and after. And we collect information about individual attitudes and preferences and several different components of behaviors and choices, also related not only to travel behavior, but also the adoption of new mobility services, smartphone-based services, uh, vehicle ownership, propensity to change the vehicle ownership in the household, but also the uh, adoption eventually of alternative fuel vehicles and so on. And very detailed information, of course, about household organization, interaction between the members of the household and so on. So um, let me dive in the remaining minutes I have into some key findings about some topics, and then I will be happy to answer any question uh, in the available time or also in the chat box or in the Facebook group. So uh, first of all, let's focus a little bit about uh, some of the equity impacts that our uh, uh, research is showing. Uh, so if we look at the information about uh, those that are reported, uh, financial stress during the pandemic. We see that, uh, uh, of course, like, you know, a considerable portion of our respondents uh, report that during the pandemic, their budget was more tight. But let's also be honest, uh, some of us, like uh, uh, all of us today, perhaps, uh, I, I call ourselves the privileged. We still have a job, we can work from home, and relatively, we were less affected probably by the pandemic. But there's a lot of uh, other individuals in the population that unfortunately have been much more affected by the pandemic. And when we look at financial impacts of the pandemic or also our issues in the job market, we see that individuals in the lower income households and lower socioeconomic groups have been affected much more in terms of the financial impacts, but also the likelihood that they were losing their job, being furloughed without pay, or even their place of employment ran out of business. 
even when we look at telecommuting, of course, the pandemic has pushed the adoption of telecommuting much stronger in the society. But if you look at uh, the individuals that have really made uh, biggest use of telecommuting and working from home, this is much more likely to be in the higher income group. In the lower income group, we see that they are uh, among those that still have a job. We can see that actually that a lot of respondents, they could not adopt telecommuting. The frequency of using telecommuting has remained in the zero category, uh, zero days per week. And also much more likely they are to report that they are essential workers. And so they need to continue to work. Uh, as we look at the data in use of public transportation, for example, we see a big decline in the use of public transportation, in particular among the white and uh, um, uh, uh, groups uh, in terms of racial composition in the United States, but also we see an uh, increase percentage-wise of uh, uh, labor workers uh, and minorities on public transportation, for example. So somehow those that have the ability to work from home, they're staying at home, total ridership is down, but also the percentage uh, somehow of the minority groups is much higher because they, they are more likely to be uh, still having to go to work. Well, if you look at other technologies, e-shopping is another interesting finding because we see uh, what we call the democratization of e-shopping. Somehow e-shopping has spread out uh, into uh, groups that uh, were not the early adopters. We see elderly users using e-shopping more now. We see individuals that are concerned about the health impacts, non-urban population having an increase of e-shopping. Unfortunately, there is still a gap with the low-income households. And this is probably more a permanent finding because the pandemic has largely uh, accelerated a trend that was already existing in society. On the other hand, the other big uh, factor, for example, is the use of food delivery apps. Services like Uber Eats or DoorDash, Instacart, all these services that bring our food directly to home. And we see like a big adoption, but this is mainly focused in our data among uh, urban, younger, dynamic segments of the population in urban areas. And also we find a big uh, relationship in the models we're developing in uh, seeing that the same users of these services are also those that have uh, drastically reduced their visit to restaurants. So this may be more like a temporary trend when these patrons return to restaurants, maybe the use of the services will go down. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I just want to mention very quickly, we are a little bit concerned about the increasing car dependence in society. We see an increase in uh, uh, interest to buy a vehicle, in particular among the segments that currently live without a vehicle or they live with few vehicles in the household. This is concerning. It's also matching data from dealership and car sales that we see, and also reduction in uh, interest in adopting car light and multimodal lifestyle. So um, my last slide is really pointing to some potential equity issues. I already discussed some of these. The technology might actually exacerbate some of these too, but also potential environmental issues. We see that even if individuals are working from home, the recovering car travel can largely be explained with discretionary trips, with a model shift from public transportation to cars. There's also a big substitution we have observed in our data between air travel and car travel. So a lot of individuals that have cut their vacation by airplane, they drive more. Also those that fly less for work, now they drive more. And uh, all these things together, the increased car dependence, uh, the lower interest in living without a car, the potential land use changes. I didn't have the time to go into that. We could also discuss this in the question and answer. All this could actually exacerbate the situation. Also considering the time in which in particular in the US, public transportation operators are under stress from a budget perspective. They might even be forced to cut service and we might have other changes in supply with mergers of uh, new mobility companies that is already happening, for example, with the merger between Jump and Lime. So somehow the system, the supply is changing too. This will bring some further changes in demand. I will pause here acknowledging the great group of students in particular and colleagues with which we are working. And I'll probably have time for one or two questions. I don't know, Rolf. Yeah, we are running out of time, but thank you so much, Giovanni, for giving this presentation. I was impressed by what kind of data you're, you're able to collect at the three revolutions lab and what kind of analyses you can do with this. Um, in the interest of time, I would like to put the discussion into the email or the Facebook website and move on. Our next presentation is by Chandrima Mukhopadhyay from the Ahmedat University in India. Chandrima, are you there? Yeah. Great, if you'd like to share your screen. In the meantime, let me just say, someone asked in the chat, um, what happens with recordings? So yes, we are recording this webinar, and those presenters who agreed, those recordings we will put on the YouTube channel of the WCTR. 
So we will send you an email as soon as this is published, but this will be after this webinar. And now it's all for you, Chandrina. Sorry, I'm... Um... I can see your slide, uh, your screen, but it was an email. One second. I don't know. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yes, this is right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present our work on uh, impact of COVID-19 on urban transport sector um, in Indian cities. It's part of a bigger project called Optimism, and it's funded by Department of Biotechnology Government of India. Optimism is um, opportunities for GHG emission mitigation and SDGs, and we are working on urban transport sector. As a background, IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees centigrade identify essential transitions that will require rapid, extensive, and unprecedented change. Some mitigation transition will provide significant co-benefits with achieving the SDGs. In other cases, this can present a trade-off. For example, public transport, a bus rapid transit system or metro would require land can cause eviction and displacement. So many of the interactions of mitigation action and SDGs occur both ways. That means there is a two-way relationship and these are non-linear over time and space. So we have tried to, our, our study is a larger one and it, we started this before COVID started. But when we were doing the field work, then um, we did it in a post-COVID uh, scenario. So we are trying to conceptualize the alignment of post-COVID scenario with mitigation and SDGs. Um, there are some examples. There is an inclination towards increased use of private vehicles, which would have trade-off with mitigation and sustainability. There is an inclination towards reduced travel demand, which would have synergy with mitigation. However, there, that would affect the demand for public transport. There is increased use of non-motorized transport, which has synergy with mitigation and sustainability. There is um, improved uh, quality of service for public transport, which has synergy with both mitigation and sustainability. However, there will be affordability issues. So just to give a background of the spread of COVID-19 in India, um, we started on 25th March of 2020, we started the lockdown for a continuous uh, 68 days. All intercity and intracity public transport were totally suspended for first 50 days. Then trains started on the 51st day, and informally buses began carrying um, many migrants back to their uh, origin of uh, city. On the 50, 55th day, the plying of intracity bus-based public transport permitted and 69th day, IPT, which is auto rickshaw, popular mode in India, that started. 45% um, of COVID-19 cases were reported from five mega cities in India, which has to do with high uh, density and poor sanitation conditions. Now we ran an online survey and it's a bigger survey. We just included two questions related to COVID. So we asked, this survey was with um, experts on Indian cities. So in general Indian cities, and we asked the experts to rank the interaction between the low carbon interventions on the left hand column with two targets of SDG3 and SDG5. SDG3 is United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. SDG3 is on health and well-being. And we asked what would be the interaction with improved hygiene in post-COVID scenario. And SDG5 is on gender equality. So we asked what would be the interaction for improved safety of women in post-COVID scenario. Now the rank uh, shows, this one is we are uh, presenting the data on mode. That is the most frequently answered uh, response. And the darkest green color, it shows there is a strong interaction, positive interaction. The light green shows there is positive interaction. However, there is uh, space for improvement. And the gray color shows there is no interaction. So on the left-hand column, the SDG3 one, we see it's all darkest green except frequency for BRTS. And on the right-hand side, we see uh, public bus services and uh, walkways. This has light green, so it still has scope for improvement to have very strong uh, positive impact on women's safety and uh, frequency of service of metro and availability of electric bus doesn't have to do anything with uh, women's safety. Now we are looking into two cities for our cases. One is Surat in Gujarat and another is Udaipur in Rajasthan. 
So Surat is a metropolitan town. Its population was 5.9 million in 2016, and its economy is based on diamond and textile industry. Udaipur is a tourism-based city. Its population was 0.8 million in 2016. Here is a very quick uh, representation of what's the modal share and for passenger transport and attribute like which mode attributes to what percentage of air pollution and greenhouse gas emission in 2016. And this shows two-wheeler is a very popular mode. It has higher highest modal share amongst passenger transport in both the cities. And it also contributes significantly towards GHG emission and air pollution. In terms of the lower um, row, it shows the physical footprint for each mode. It's on per capita meter square. And it's an India specific standard. So I'll just start, we just tried to show this that 1.25 meter square was the normal, in a normal situation would be the footprint if you were using a bus service, but it increases to almost double when you were maintaining social distance. Also on the on field survey, city specific survey, we asked two questions. One is on will you change your travel behavior after COVID? And the second is if yes, what would be the change? So, um, and these are, we are presenting the data in terms of based on different mode users. Most of them said yes. And the change of behavior will take place in terms of reduced travel demand and mode of more use of public vehicle, uh, private vehicle. A third question, this was not related to COVID, but we had asked if there is improved non-motorized transport infrastructure available, would you like to shift to non-motorized transport instead of using your current mode. So there was a quite a positive response. This is Surat's response and this is uh, Udaipur. As I had told, Surat is a metropolitan town. So Udaipur is a, a smaller town and also a significant population. It's coming from the, the tourist. So there is a little bit change, but there are positive uh, responses to that. Now uh, to wrap up with cycle for change, the national government, they started a program cycle for change under smart city mission with ITTP as a post COVID response. And they are this is a city level competition. So this is being implemented through the state government and city government and implemented through private sector on the ground. And Surat is having a cycle for change. Uh, they have started implementing cycle for change. Udaipur uh, doesn't, haven't opted for cycle for change yet. So this is the last slide to wrap up with. Um, so what could be the, with, while there were already many challenges related to public transport, including COVID-19, will the city's public transport system be able to cope with increased um, need for hygiene and social distancing? So first of all, the general process of improving public transport coverage and it's linked to IPT, um, that is uh, auto rickshaws that provide first mile, last mile connectivity, that has to continue. Second, since from the survey data, we see there is a willingness to shift to non-motorized transport infrastructure, there could be more investment made to non-motorized transport infrastructure. Third, all this will have significant financial implication for the city's public transport budget. Besides this, regular disinfecting of the vehicles and their terminals will add to the cost. Fourth, IPT, which is auto rickshaw, it has to move to, it's a popular mode. And it's also a low occupancy vehicle. So it's a safer option to use during COVID. However, IPT also has contributed significantly towards GHG emission. So there has to be transition towards low carbon option. And auto rickshaws employ urban poor because this is mostly informal sector. So that's a, that would have a positive impact on sustainability. And finally, two wheelers we have seen in both cities. Two wheelers have higher modal share they improve mobility of women and urban poor, and it's a personalized mode. Even during COVID, uh, even as carpooling option, two-wheeler became very popular. So there should be focus on transition towards electric vehicle uh, two-wheelers as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Shandringa. That was very good. In the interest of time, I need to put the discussion again on the Facebook group or by email, or you may also use the chat window. Um, but I really appreciate that you remind us of the sustainable development goals because sometimes we get so focused on research on COVID-19 that we forget the sustainable development goals. So thank you very much for presenting this today. 
I would like to move on to Professor Shafiq Ur Rahman from the Yahangirna University in Bangladesh. And I know you were there earlier. Yeah. You to start your presentation. Okay, just let me share my slides. Yeah. That's working well. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, the impacts of COVID-19 on mobility of elderly and disabled people. Um, this is um, uh, this research is funded by a high volume transport applied research of UK8 uh, under the COVID uh, response and recovery transport research fund. The main purpose is to explore the changes in travel uh, of elderly and disabled people due to COVID. And conducted uh, the case studies in eight different cities of four countries. These are in Bangladesh, Dhaka and Khulna city, in Pakistan, Karachi and Lahore, in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam and Zanzibar, and in Zambia, Lusaka and Kyoto. Um, in total, uh, collected uh, more than 1,600 uh, responses from household service, um, almost 200 uh, responses from each city uh, using a predetermined questionnaire to explore their travel behavior, travel frequency, what is the mode they use, uh, the travel distance, the purpose of using the mode, cost, the problems they face during the COVID, both lockdown and post lockdown, and also before COVID situation so that we can uh, compare. Uh, if we look on the travel frequency before COVID, so the frequency of the respondents was mainly uh, two to three trips, four to five trips, or also four, more than five trips per week. But during the lockdown, more than half of the respondents, they did not travel. They avoided travel. And those who traveled, the trips trip was just only once in a week or two to three trips per week. But post lockdown, the frequency increased. If we look on the trips, uh, one trips or two to three trips, or for some respondents, they had four to five trips per week. But these are not similar in eight different cities. So all cities, they, they have differences because the response from the government was different. For example, during the lockdown, the cities in Bangladesh and Pakistan, all the transport was suspended. All the institutions, businesses were closed. But cities in, in Tanzania and Zambia, only the academic institutions were closed and um, the business was as usual, uh, maintaining the uh, social, physical distancing and other um, health protocols. Uh, for the travel purposes, usually the, the elder and, and disabled people, their, their purpose was uh, for their personal needs, if their work and grocery or for shopping. But during the lockdown, the doctor's visit that was also mentioned by many respondents and also the grocery work and personal needs because they need to, to, to have the, the immediate needs to, to survive. And social and recreational trips, or trips were avoided. But the post lockdown is similar to the lockdown situation, doctor's visit, purchasing the medicines, and also other important needs, uh, for example, shopping uh, uh, and personal needs. But social trips in all the cities, around 10% trips are for social purposes, but still recreation trips are very, very low. So in post lockdown also, uh, may, and many respondents in, in these cities, they are avoiding the recreational trips. When you look on the distances, the Lockdown time trip distances are very short. More than half of the trips in Dhaka, Khulna, and Karachi are within one kilometer. And 
other trips are uh, the remaining are uh, uh, between two and five kilometer. But during the post lockdown, the distance increased. Even though these are mostly within five kilometer, but a small portion of the respondents they mentioned the trip distance of uh, between ten to twenty kilometer. If we look on the travel mode, the the usually in these developing country cities, the public transport is not very good. Usually, all the people they they complain about the public transport services and are physically uh, challenged or disabled people and older people, they have more challenges to have access on the public transport services. And uh, that's also, also mentioned uh, the, uh, the respondents, even though not all of them or, or majority of them are using the public transport, but when we look on the, on the trips, uh, the public transport and and uh, paratransit they served a significant portion of the trips during the lockdown the portion of the public transport and paratransit just reduced and increased the active mode so in all the cities they had around 40 to 60 percent of the trips were walking trips and the, during the post lockdown Personal vehicles like cars and motorcycles and paratransit, these also increased because the, during the post lockdown, some of the respondents they were using the paratransit like taxi taxi type services. These are the data from all the different cities. As I mentioned uh, during the lockdown, the, um, the orange bars, uh, these are very very low for the public transport. Uh, even though in some cities. The, the bus for the for the public transport is higher. For example, Dar es Salaam, uh, Zanzibar, because uh, most of the people they are dependent on on public transport. They don't have any other options. Whereas in the in Karachi and and Lahore, the private vehicles are uh, the proportion is very high, because the the sample we got their car ownership in in Karachi and Lahore is higher. So what are the changes um, due to the COVID? So let's figure, that's showing the changes in travel and um, whether the, they, they have uh, faced any other uh, additional problems because of the COVID. Um, the changes in travel and mobility, so the, the green bars, these are showing the percentage of the respondent, they mentioned, yes, they're facing the problems because of the COVID and the orange one indicates the percentage of, of the respondents who mentioned that they are facing additional problems. So the changes like uh, they had to change the, the travel mode or, or route or uh, they had to change the travel frequency, these are the things. The right side, the, the right hand side, the graph is showing uh, the increased travel cost the proportion of the respondents are mentioned, the green bars, and the orange one is showing the percentage of the respondents who mentioned that their household income decreased. And the respondents, they accompanied by another person during the travel. Usually that ranges in, in these cities uh, 10 to 50%. But during the lockdown and post lockdown, the proportion of the respondents are accompanied by other person is higher than it was uh, before COVID. So the travel problems, the respondents were asked to, to mention what type of the problems they're facing during the, uh, the, the, the lockdown and post lockdown. And what are the problems before the COVID? So the response are, like um, the other people uh, who are physically fit or, or young adults, uh, similar to those, what the, they will mention, similar uh, to those problems they mentioned before COVID, like the poor public transport, poor infrastructure, and, and poor access uh, to the public transport, congestion and pollution. But during the lockdown, 
The problem they mentioned the limited public transport availability, they say longer waiting time, reduced travel due to imposed restriction, and also the movement, and they're scared about going outside. And they need to walk more because of the, the unavailability of a vehicle and, and that another difficulties for them to walk. With the post-lockdown, the major problems are reduced the uh, availability of, of tra travel modes, increased travel cost, and um, wearing the face mask are not comfortable for them, and um, lack of compliance um, in public transport or in, in outside uh, wearing the mask and other things. So if I conclude, the, the findings from eight different cities are not similar there a difference because the, uh, the socioeconomic condition and public transport situation of the cities are different. And also response from the government, city authority is different. As I mentioned, that during the lockdown, there's very strict lockdown in, in uh, Bangladesh and Pakistani cities, whereas not so strong in Tanzania and uh, Zambian city. So I'll stop here. If uh, any questions, then I will respond. Thank you so much, Shafiko. We are running out of time, so I need to put the questions again into the chat or as a Facebook group or by email. But thank you very much because the, your presentation gives us a glimpse of how the impact of COVID-19 might affect travel behavior in the future. Thank you. I would next like to go to Ana Luisa Silva. She works with ONG La Lana, which is an institution that works for sustainable development in the rural world. And Anna, if you're there, can I start? Can I ask you to start your presentation? Yes. Yeah, that works. I'm just, uh, okay, here we go. Right. So, um, hi everyone. My name is Ana Luisa Silva. Um, I am a researcher and member of uh, ONG Lalana. Lalana is an NGO based in Madagascar that has over 20 years of experience working in transport and mobility uh, issues. I will be presenting today the findings of our recent research uh, funded uh, also by UK Aid and the High Volume Transport Applied Research on the COVID-19 impacts on the peri-urban mobility of women in vulnerable households in Antananarivo, uh, Madagascar. Um, the research questions we were looking at in this research were three. First, we, look, we wanted to understand how the lives and mobility of women living in these areas were affected by transport-related virus containment measures. Um, secondly, we wanted to compare the changes in COVID-19 impacts we were observing to the experiences in other low-income countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. And finally, we were looking at finding solutions identified either by users or local stakeholders or even inspired by other experiences in other countries that could be implemented in Madagascar in the short term and in the long term to improve the transport system in the peri-urban areas. This research was conducted between October and December 2020. We selected nine municipalities around Antananarivo urban center in Madagascar. So Antananarivo, just as a side note, is the capital of Madagascar and its largest city with 1.3 million uh, people living in its urban center plus 3.6 million living in its very urban areas. In this research, we used a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods, and we engaged with approximately 230 stakeholders in focus group discussions and 901 households through a household survey. Throughout the research, we held meetings online with researchers and practitioners in 10 other low-income countries from Africa and Southeast Asia. So the context we are working in is um, one of the most uh, vulnerable in Madagascar. In fact, uh, the World Bank had already um, predicted um, and warned to the fact that um, these uh, urban household were, households were more vulnerable to shocks like COVID-19 than households in uh, rural Madagascar. Um, our, the findings of our household study um, household survey um, support uh, these findings and show that 
65% of our surveyed households were already living under the poverty line. And during the COVID-19 restriction, this figure um, went up to 80%. Although we're looking at peri-urban areas, agriculture is still a key activity for many people um, living in these areas and about 54% still engage in some form of agricultural activity. Another point that is important to mention is that half of households that we surveyed still depend on daily revenues for, um, their, uh, for, for, for providing for their families and for daily survival. Women provide an important part of these daily revenues because they are responsible for agricultural market trading with the urban markets uh, regularly. Talking about transport, minibuses are the only regulated form of public transport in these very urban areas. And they are also the most used mode of transport followed by walking and bicycles. Half of, the survey, of our surveyed households do not own any mode of transport. Um, and if they do, these are going to be uh, bicycles. Last year, between March and September 2020, Madagascar was under a state of emergency and the government imposed strict transport and mobility restrictions that affected especially uh, Antananarivo, the capital and its surrounding areas because these were the areas most affected by the virus in the country. The measures um, ranged from uh, periods of full lockdown with full transport, public transport ban, and periods of partial lockdown with partial uh, transport ban, curfew, um, and other mobility restrictions. Um, since September, these restrictions were lifted, but there are still uh, some measures in, that affect public transport, like mandatory mask wearing, um, in, hygiene protocols, and reduction in the number of passengers allowed inside transport. So what were the impacts of these COVID-19 related uh, restrictions on, on mobility patterns in these um, areas? Um, we've identified uh, two major pattern changes. Uh, one is related to travel frequency, frequency and another one is related to the drop in the use of minibuses. So first of all, we can we could, we observed changes important changes in the frequency of travel and um, most importantly the number of the the number of daily trips dropped by half so basically people still kept um, traveling they it was not possible for them to to do telework um, and they needed to to move for their daily survival but they did change the frequency of travel and we observed that this was greater for those doing non-agricultural activities uh, which suggests that uh, some salary workers might have lost their jobs. And then, of course, we saw in the absence of, um, of minibuses, and we see here um, highlighted in red, that there was a very important drop in the use of minibuses in, the, um, in, these, in these areas. Um, and in the absence of minibuses, people, um, the, one, the only option for most people was walking. And uh, there was a perception before we started our research that the number of bicycles uh, had increased, but um, our, our research doesn't show that, just shows that the bicycle use kept constant, as you can see um, in, in, in the bar in, yellow, in uh, orange there. The situation in Madagascar was similar to experiences in other low-income countries that we discussed with, uh, such as Nepal, Myanmar, Uganda, and Malawi. We looked um, at gender specific um, issues. And first of all, we would like to point out um, that we, the, the biggest, um, the most important uh, thing that we noticed was that um, women in the absence of public transport like minibuses um, had less um, transport options available. You can see there uh, that the walking in blue um, increases more for women than for men um, who have more access to private transport like bicycles. So if a household ho uh, owns a bicycle, it's more likely that it's the men using that, um, that mode of transport than a woman. So women that we encountered reported that in the absence of mini buses, they walked more uh, for longer hours, they were exhausted. And before COVID-19, it was common for, for 
example, female market traders to carry their go goods by minibus into the markets in the city, um, starting their journey as early as 1 a.m. to get to the markets um, as they open early in the morning, and then either take the bus back or walk back without um, having sold their products. Um, in the absence of minibuses, they were forced to walk both ways, sometimes carrying their products. Um, one um, and these were for distances between two to 10 kilom kilometers, so um, they were significant uh, travel times. One interesting thing that we found also was that um, some women um, stated that uh, male mem members of household uh, seeing their exhaustion actually replaced them carrying goods to markets using bicycles um, to, to carry products. So that was an interesting finding, finding from our research. And then I would like to conclude because I know that we don't have a lot of time. Um, and as we've seen elsewhere, the COVID-19 restrictions um, uh, highlighted existing transport system fragilities in peri-urban and Tananarivo. Um, these uh, re restrictions that were aimed at um, reducing the spread of the virus had a negative impact in the in livelihoods and in, they meant that in the absence of public the only public transport available walking was really the only option for for many people our research also shows that in bicycles and intermediate modes of transport are an important part of the transport system in the city but the infrastructure is actually not adapted for it Thirdly, um, measures were taken by the central government uh, without, um, in, without uh, considering in the decision-making processes the needs of the users and local government, and this had um, a negative impact also um, in the, the, the mobility um, and the livelihoods of the population. Finally, our research also shows that the negative impacts of absence of public transport are much higher for, for women who have much less access to private transport um, than than men and who also um, uh, travel more uh, than, than men in these areas that we're working on. So if we are going to use the findings of the state of emergency in context like Madagascar to reform public transport systems um, around uh, cities in low-income countries, these are some of the issues that we should be considering for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. It was a great presentation. It's a good reminder. We always like to look at the averages across the entire population by looking at different social economic groups, such as women and men or low income and high income. It shows a very different picture. Thank you so much. Thank you. Discussion will happen on Facebook and um, by email and in the chat. And that completes our first block of presentations on travel behavior research and COVID-19.